Hi, welcome back to Better Than Yourself. Today on Better Than Yourself, I want to take, well, I just want to take a break from uh, the usual, I just want to take a look at some of the, the tools that we use in fermenting, some of the real common questions that people ask about fermenting, and try to just kind of elucidate all of you that it's really not anything fancy that we're doing. It's not anything that you need to go and spend your entire allowance on. It's, it's really pretty simple. You really, when, you, when we're lacto-fermenting, you just need to keep in mind that all you're trying to do is create an environment where those lactobacteria can go to work on the vegetable that you're fermenting. So the lactobacteria, I've seen a lot of people go out and buy, run out to different places on the internet and different uh, websites that they have, and they buy these cultures. And they're $30, $40 for a packet of cultures. They're absolutely not needed. All the, all the bacteria that you need, all the lactobacillus and all of the fancy things that you read on the little packages, they come with the vegetables. They're, they're the free inside. A lot of people very diligently scrub them off and, and chop them up and eat them in salads. But what you can do is you can harbor those bacteria that naturally occur on the, on the, on the vegetables, on the fruit, on the th different things that you're fermenting, and just keep those alive for a couple of days, maybe a week, and create a, an environment where they can grow, where they can reproduce, and eat all of the sugars and the different carbohydrates in the vegetables, convert those sugars into acids, specifically lactic acid, and ferment the vegetables. That's all we're trying to do. So you see all these people on here, all these people on, on YouTube that are going through all these elaborate schemes with jars and bottles and tubes and different kind of clamps and buckets and lids and tops and different things. It's you're, you're getting away, you're, you're, you're losing your focus. All I'm trying to say is all you need to do is find some kind of a container that you can put your vegetables in, cover with brine, and then exclude oxygen is all you're trying to do. So there's a lot of ways to do that, and I think you've seen, you've pretty much seen the gamut here on YouTube. But let's, let's look at some of the options. I mean, you see, even some of my earlier videos from a couple years ago, I was using these old Crocs. They're gorgeous old Crocs. They've been in the family for years. I've been using them for, for years. The problem with them is that the glaze on them, this shiny stuff that they cover the, the ceramic with, in days of old, people didn't realize that lead was poisonous. And lead makes a very durable finish, makes a very um, you know th a sturdy finish. And unfortunately, when you soak vegetables in here in brine, you're creating an, ele an electrolytic solution, number one. And number two, you're creating an acidic solution. That acid will get into this glaze and leach out the lead. I don't know, I always thought this was calcium. Maybe this is lead oxide leaching out of the, the ceramic? Don't know. So if you have these, great. Use them. Put a plant in them. Put your, uh, put your kitchen utensils in them. Keep them on the counter. Display them. Share them with your friends. They're gorgeous. Unfortunately, they're probably just not really safe to store food in anymore. Not that they ever were, but we know better these days. So we're going to move away from Crocs. So a more modern alternative might be something like this. This is an anchor hocking one gallon. I think they call it a cookie jar, actually. But makes a great crock. Definitely gives you a lot of room for getting a gallon's worth of vegetables in here. Comes with this nice uh, lid. So same as what you're doing in the crock there. Put your vegetables in here, put your brine in, and then weight it down. One thing that I like using for a big weight like this, I mean, if you've got a, a round plate that'll fit down in there, and then maybe a jar of water, just to kind of hold everything down below the surface works real well. Another thing you can do is take a, a plastic bag, fill it with water, and then lay that right down in on top. And the water weight will hold this bag down in there. And the, the, the brine will come up over the bag. And that'll give you a great way. Just You can spread this out and rest it right down over the vegetables. And then let the brine come up a little bit. Then if any mold or anything forms on the surface, it's fine. You can just get a little spoon and skim it out. Not a problem. If you're not making this much, just a, a, a half gallon jar. These are real inexpensive. You can purchase these online. Same drill. You can use, you know, or even a smaller amount. You just, you know, depending on how much vegetable you have, how much stuff you want to ferment, just find the right size jar. So just say, for example, that I wanted to ferment this celery today. You know, and I only had that much. This, I think, was about four stalks of celery. Cut it up, put it in a reasonable sized container, find some kind of a little weight that fits down in top of there, 
pour in your brine, and you're done. If you want, you can put you know, a piece of little cloth over this or a paper towel with a rubber band. That's kind of nice. Keeps a little bit of the, you know, the flies out, keeps the dust out, anything like that. And you'll find that a lot of times when you're fermenting like this in an open container, that you'll get just sort of a scum on top of the liquid after a couple of days. You get this sort of white chalky film across the whole level of the, of the ferment. It's harmless, it's yeast. It's called common yeast. And it's just a naturally occurring, occurs in the air yeast that will collect and start to grow on, on a surface of a ferment like this. Some people say, hey, just stir it in, it's good for you. Ah, you can. I don't. I actually, I pour mine off. You can actually, if you, if you are clever, you can put it under the faucet, turn the faucet on, and let the surface of the, the liquid come up enough that it just kind of rinses clean. So that's one way to go. Another thing that's kind of neat, you can find these online. These are pickle pipes, and they're made by the Mason Top Company. It's just a piece of silicone with a little, little nipple in the top. And you can literally, once you get this filled up with your brine, put this on and hold it in place with a canning ring. And the little tip will vent here. Again, completely optional. Real good in terms of keeping the mold out, keeping the yeast out. If you don't want to do an open container ferment like this, completely up to you. You saw this little weight that I put in here. These are clever. This is just a, I don't know, three inch um, in diameter by half inch thick piece of glass. It's a pickle pebble made by the same company. And you literally can just drop it inside a, a, a wide mouth jar, a wide mouth canning jar. So another, another nice option. Another option might be a kilner jar. These are uh, an older style canning jar. These have been around for a while, but with a flip top lid, a, a, a bale closure, and they've got a rubber gasket here, which is nice. You can put your ferment in here, close the lid, and I've seen people just rubber band them shut. I actually just clamp the lids right on. These, they're a canning jar, and just like putting, uh, when you, you do some canning and you put your jam in here and you put on the, the screw top with the, little depre with the little button lid, these keep a vacuum. So if you fill this with vegetables and boil it for this size, probably about 45 minutes in a pressure cooker, and as it cools, it creates a vacuum and seals it in there and literally cans it, if you use it the opposite way and you're fermenting it and there's something that's creating gas and like I said all these these ferments give off carbon dioxide so they need to get vented this little lip is great for holding in a vacuum it can't hold in pressure so this will literally burp itself these jars will I mean you can open it and see but it really won't build up that much pressure so these are nice to use because this gasket will actually let the excess pressure out so this is, a, this is a nice option as well, a Kilner jar. So to take that same process a little bit further, you can actually get a pre-drilled Kilner jar top that you can fit an airlock into. If you're not completely convinced that this thing's gonna breathe and let the, the, the gas bubbles out, you can actually take a, take a cue from the wine makers and the wine fermenters that they actually put a little airlock in the top of their ferments. And you can see this one, this one's kind of cold, so it's not really fermenting too much, but you can see that the air will come up and go down and through and just bubble out. And the air is locked in, or I guess I should say locked out, by the, by the little volume of water right here. So as the pressure builds up, the pressure can come out the stem here and then uh, bubble up through this, but nothing can go back in the other way. And even if it gets really cold and you know everything contracts and it sucks in, it still won't suck this little volume back up through the airlock because of this large space here. So this is a nice blend. You'll see these a lot. You probably recognize these from the apple cider vinegar from last fall that I did this and put a large volume of apple juice in here with some yeast and then put the, the fermenting top on. And th these are nice, this is just a gallon glass jug. This is an old wine jug that I recycled. And you can, you can ferment a lot of liquid in, in something like this and then use the, the airlock to prevent anything from getting down into this. Especially when you're fermenting with yeast. When you're doing a pure ferment with just, you know, sugar, carbohydrates, fruit juice, and yeast, you really want to use a, an airlock on something like this because you don't want the any of that extra atmosphere, whatever's floating around in your kitchen, to get into this bottle because it will contaminate. You will get acetobacters. You will get various types of bacteria in here that will cause your yeast ferment to go bad. 
So if you're fermenting anything with yeast and you're trying to get alcohol, absolutely use an airlock because without an airlock you'll get acetobacters. Acetobacters take alcohol and ferment it into acetic acid. Just like lactobacters take sugar and ferment it into lactic acid, acetobacters can get into wine and alcoholic ferments and take that alcohol and ferment it into acetic acid. And makes awesome vinegar, makes really bad wine. Or, which is so which is where vinegar gets its name is is vinagre is a, is bad wine is is mad angry wine or or acidic wine that is turned into vinegar so the airlock is good not completely necessary in a lacto ferment like i said you can just do an open ferment with a all you really need to do is make sure is that you've got some kind of a weight you've got some kind of a all that matters when you do an open ferment is that whatever you're fermenting is under the surface of the liquid so, I mean, a little jam jar, a little leftover mustard jar if you want. Just something that will fit down inside your vessel and allow the, the liquid, the brine, to come up above the surface of the thing that you're fermenting. So, let, I've been talking about the, the brine, you know, you can see my brine that I've got in here. I've been talking about putting brine on top of my vegetables. What is brine? Brine is salt water. Brine is strictly pure water, filtered water, don't use tap water, don't use water right out of your tap. You've been watching my videos, you know that I use tap water and you hopefully know that I've got a well. So I know what's coming out of that tap and it's nothing but water. There's no fluoride, there's no chloride, chloramine, chlor chloride. There it's clean water. All of those other additives, all those, you know, if you're on municipal water, the, the city is adding probably fluoride because someone decided that fluoride was good for your teeth. Someone decided that it's, you can't have any bacteria, coliform, evil things in your water, which is not true, I suppose. Don't want to be drinking that stuff. So lacking a good water source, they take what might be not real drinkable water and they kill all the bacteria in it and process the water. So they'll add chlorine, they'll add chloramide, they'll add different things to the water to kill off the bacteria and then they can filter it and give the people of the city water to drink. Unfortunately, the things that they add to the water to kill the bad bacteria will also kill the good bacteria, the bacteria that we're trying to culture in our, in our ferments is, is not going to be happy with the chloramide and the chlorine and all that stuff in it. So if, if you don't have a good water source, buy bottled water. Buy, find some water that is pure, probably distilled water even. I've heard reports of people buying bottled water and it's, it's processed water. It's basically tap water that they get away with selling as bottled water and there's chlorine in it, there's chloramide in it. You pour it in your ferment and it kills all your bacteria and it'll be frustrating. So probably the safest thing to do is just buy distilled water. If you don't want to go through the expense and time of, of always having to go out and buy distilled water, a Britter water filter is actually super efficient at removing chloramide, at removing chlorine, at removing fluoride. All of that stuff that's bad for your ferments will re get removed with the little carbon filter. So all that stuff that's going to be bad for you and bad for your friends, the, the, the lactobacters, will get removed by running it through a carbon drinking water filter. So pick up a, a, a Britter water filter with a little carbon cartridge in it, run your water through that, and then use that water to make your brine. How do you make brine? Brine's nothing more than, than salt and water. So you can look for any kind of salt that doesn't have iodine in it. Iodine, another one of those additives, people need to as just an essential element, you can't produce iodine. So they add iodine to salt and people eat iodine in their salt and it's good for their diet. If you're making brine to ferment with, iodine kills bacteria. So look for salt, look for natural salts. Himalayan salt, there's usually a picture of some mountains on it, there's a reason. Himalayan salt, this is not sea salt. This is mountain salt. They actually mine this out of the Himalayan mountains and it's got this pretty pink color because of the, the trace minerals and the elements that are in the salt get into the, the finished product, get into the, the pink salt. So Himalayan mountain salt, not sea salt, it's Himalayan salt, Himalayan pink salt is a great option. I use this a lot. I buy this in five pound bags. 
this is a great brand, uh, Selena Naturally Celtic Sea Salt. I love this stuff. You can, you can pick this up online in a five pound bag for about 20, 30 bucks. And last forever, I, I buy these bags every couple of months and put them in everything I cook with it, make my brine with it, and I love this stuff, Celtic Sea Salt. So let's talk about making brine. The simplest recipe for brine that I do in basically all the videos, every time you see me ferment something and I pour the brine in, brine is super simple to make. You want your brine to be about between two and four percent for your for your brines. Anything more than four percent, number one, is gonna be super salty and you're not really gonna enjoy the finished product. It will ferment very slowly and definitely won't get any mold or anything weird growing in it because of all that salt. It's really just gonna kill everything off. You can ferment with no salt. You can literally just pour fresh water, filtered water, in, on top of your vegetables, put your little weight down, keep them submerged, and just let them ferment in water. I know people that do that and have good success. There's kind of a chance that the whole thing's just gonna turn sort of putrid and rot. Um, not really, not really the best method of operations. If you're, you know, you're just can't take salt if you've on a salt restricted diet, and maybe just use a little. It depends on your diet, you know. Talk to your doctor about that. So to make two percent brine, I use a half a gallon of water, two quarts of water, and then three tablespoons of salt. Mix that up. I know you're thinking, you're thinking, wait a minute, he just used a metal implement. Yeah, I'm using high quality cookware. This is stainless steel. You can use stainless steel in just about everything you do. You can, you, you can stir with stainless steel, you can use stainless steel tongs to put down inside your ferments. You can even, if you own something, a big giant fermenting stainless steel container, you're fine. When people say don't use metal in ferments, they're referring to aluminum. They're referring to copper. They're referring to lead. <laughs> um, but if you, if, yeah, if you've got good quality stainless steel kitchen implements, you don't have to worry about using metal. You don't need to run out and buy all plastic implements. There's people that'll tell you not to use plastic. That there's you're gonna leach out of plastic. I don't generally ferment anything in plastic. You can see all of my fermenting containers are not plastic. Um, I'll mix up my brine in plastic. My salt is stored in plastic. But you know, it's just really, I don't think there's a lot to worry about there. So once you've got your brine mixed up and you've got your vegetables cut up, like I said, cover your vegetables with brine and you see how everything floats? Immediately everything's on the top of the jar and there's going to be mold. Wherever this, these little bits are exposed to oxygen, they're going to mold. So like I said, just get some kind of a little jar that you can rest in there. You saw the water come up and this is ready. Just put this aside for a couple of days and it'll probably be tasted fermented, a little sour. And you'll find as, as you're fermenting, it's a continuous process. You might ferment something and forget about it. Leave it in the, your little dark pantry where you put your ferments for a month and you go back and taste it and it's really sour. You don't need to do that. There's gonna be a lot of probiotics in it if that's what you're after. If you're looking for probiotics, then that's fine, great, enjoy. Some people don't like it that sour and you really don't need to eat it that sour. So I generally find I'll, I'll put something like this up for about three days, four days, and I'll taste it, get a little taste, stick a fork in there, bite one, see how it is, and then decide, is this how I want it to taste? Do I want to eat this whole jar? And if, in which case, if it's done, if it's the way I like it, it's personal taste, whatever, if it works for you, then good. If it, if it tastes fermented enough, put it in the fridge and enjoy it. If it tastes salty, if it still tastes like it's kind of just salty vegetables in sort of a watery broth, it's not done yet, that's all. Let it go for another couple of days. Taste it again, and you'll find that as, the, as that kind of salt flavor fades into the background, you'll get that lactic acid pickle taste in the, in the foreground. And as that salt sort of disappears and that lactic acid gets into the vegetables and softens them a little bit and ferments them and pickles them, and then once you get that kind of ratio of, of sourness that you like, you're done. Put it in the fridge. Take your little weight out. At this point, you've got a good amount of, of lactic acid in here, so it's okay if these little people float. And put a plastic cap on it. The plastic isn't touching the, the liquid. You're not gonna get any, anything evil out of the plastic. If you're one of those people that worries about 
thing poisons in plastic, it's not touching the food. It's just keeping it from spilling in the fridge, basically. And this is ready to eat. This is, this is ready for the fridge. If you tasted it and you find that it's sour enough, you're good. If you taste it and it's sour enough and it's too salty, you went, oh, I shouldn't have done 4%. I shouldn't have done 3%. John was right, I should have gone 2%. If this is too salty, then literally just, you know, take it to the sink, pour off about half of the, of the fermenting liquid and replace it with fresh water. Put the cap on, stick it in the fridge overnight, and then give it another taste in the morning. You'll lose a little bit of your probiotics. You'll lose a little bit of your acid. But by and large, it'll take a ton of the salt flavor out because most of the salt is in the is in the liquid, and you can pour some of that salt off and replace it with water, and it really will taste a lot better in the morning. A couple of people have asked, well, you know, while we're on the topic of taste and you know, kind of adjusting the taste, they said, you know, I want to make something like bread and butter pickles. I, you know, I like all the spices, the mustard seeds and the the bay leaf and the brown sugar and you know those different flavors that you you get in like kind of a sweet pickle. When you're fermenting, that's not really an option. If you want that sort of sweet pickle, then go ahead and find a recipe for bread and butter pickles. It's, you know, about water and vinegar and brown sugar and some mustard seeds and a couple other things. You can, you, yeah, you can put spices in here. You can throw some mustard seeds in here. Caraway seeds are good. Maybe some um, little uh, cloves. Maybe, uh, I always put a bunch of, you can see the, the garlic in my, in my dill pickles. I love um, garlic and some uh, fresh dill fronds are awesome. But if you want something a little sweeter and you think, well, I'll just add some sugar to my, to my brine and then that'll end up being sweet, fail. Nope, won't happen. It'll actually end up being more sour because what happens is if you put sugar in this initial fermenting liquid, the lactobacters will eat that sugar and create even more lactic acid and you'll end up with an even more sour ferment. So if you're looking for something a little sweeter, if you do need to add some sweetener to your ferment, do it after it's fermented. Do it after the main fermentation process has taken place and use a non-fermentable sugar. You Don't use white sugar, don't use brown sugar, canned sugar, any of those carbohydrates, the lactobacters will ferment. Just look for some pure stevia leaf extract. It comes in a little, a little dropper bottle and you can put a couple drops in and it'll sweeten it up. The nice thing about stevia is that it, it tastes sweet but it's not a carbohydrate. So there's no calories in it and also it's not digestible. It's not something that the the lactobacters will be able to ferment and make into more lactic acid, make it even more sour. So yeah, look for stevia. If you want to do honey, again, it's a fermentable sugar. It's, you know, like I used it in my honey and garlic uh, ferment and it ferments, but it ferments really slowly. There's a lot of um, antibiotics, there's a lot of antioxidants, there's a lot of stuff in honey that will actually just the, um, the amount of, of sweetener in honey will keep it from fermenting. So the whole point of adding the garlic was to raise the moisture content of the honey so that it will ferment. When you make mead, you have to dilute the honey with a lot of water. And still, it's a very complex sugar and it's not something that ferments very quickly. So if you use honey in your ferments, yes, it works. It just takes a long time. If you watch the, the ketchup making in the condiment video, I used a little bit of honey in that. And as a result, it just takes a long time for that ketchup to ferment. So maybe a feature, maybe, you know, just something to keep in the back of your mind. Yes, you can ferment with honey, but use very little of it. And also, you know, it, it could kill your bacteria, depending on how much antibiotic, how much natural antibiotic. I'm not saying there's antibiotics in honey. I'm saying there's natural antibiotics in honey, antioxidants in honey, that can potentially do damage to your, your good bacteria. So if you, if you want to, and do any kind of fermenting. It's really, if you want the sugar to ferment, use plain white sugar. If you want to add a little sweetener to a ferment, use something like pure stevia leaf extract. Another reason why you add salt to ferments, another reason why you want to add a couple percent, a couple of, couple of tablespoons of salt to your fermenting brine, is that not only does it keep the fermentation kind of slow, keeps the fermentation in check, gets the right bacteria growing, kills off the pathogens and the bad bacteria and the mold and some of the yeasts that might try to colonize your ferment. Another thing that salt does is it protects the pectin. Um, probably the only time you've ever heard of pectin before was when you buy the little packets of it to make jam with. And But pectin actually occurs in all vegetables 
and it's the thing that makes vegetables crunchy. So you bite a piece of celery, that crunch is, um, well, cellulose, but also there's a pectin that is, makes that, the, those cell walls actually have some crunch, actually ha has them, makes that kind of crunchy characteristic. And if you want your pickles to come out crunchy, you definitely need to use some salt. The salt will protect that pectin through the fermentation process, and without it, the pectin, I don't know if it dissolves or if it gets eaten by the ferment, but the, you just lose a lot of, per, of pectin if you do a freshwater ferment. So the more salt that you use, the crispier pickles you're gonna have. So you, you're gonna, maybe you wanna, maybe you can experiment. Try, you know, a, a, a stronger brine solution and you'll end up with crisper pickles and then maybe do the, you know, the water replacement when it's done fermenting, pour half out and replace it with fresh water. And do an experiment and see how you can make the most crisp pickles without um, making them too salty. Uh, a lot of times I'll add something with a lot of tannin in it. Um, tannic acid actually is really good to keep to protect pectin and keep the the natural pectins in the in the crispness in the vegetables. So you can find tannin in oak leaves, maple leaves, horseradish leaves, um, depending on what grows around your house. I've had people say, oh yeah, I just throw a tea bag in with my pickles whenever I make them. Um, so the water will kind of come out sort of brown looking and you know, it's kind of questionable if you can be able to serve these pickles to anybody, but they'll be crisp. You can um, brew a little bit of tea and, and, and put it in the and put it in the brine. So again, something to experiment with. If you like really crisp pickles, there's actually a commercial product on the market called Pickle Crisp that you can pick up in the supermarket. You can buy this in the in the canning aisle, in the general merchandise aisle of your supermarket. And this is calcium chloride instead of sodium chloride, instead of um, regular salt. It's actually a calcium chloride. Talk to your doctor, but you might be able to get away with using this if you're on a sodium reduced diet. This is calcium chloride. And you can use this, read the directions about how to um, to make canned pickles with, with pickle crisp. It'll protect the pectin and keep your pickles crisp or your vegetables crisp, um, but it has kind of an off taste. I've had people say, yeah, they've used this, the pickles came out super crunchy and crispy and they were awesome, but they've got this funny sort of like processed taste, like they almost made it taste like commercial pickles. This is what those pickle companies use, that you buy a, you know, a jar of, of pickles in the supermarket and they're super crispy, they're canned, you know, they're sealed and, and in that can that you can keep in your pantry for years on end, but they are, they maintain their pectin, their crispness with pickle crisp, calcium chloride. One last tip, and we'll wrap this up. When you're picking out your vegetables to ferment, when you're at the farmer's market, when you're in the organic section of your grocery store and you're looking for something new that you want to ferment, you want to try fermenting, you can ferment just about anything. Let your imagination go wild with that. But one thing you want to make sure, buy the freshest possible vegetables that you can. If I, just as an experiment, I saw my my buddy at the farmer's market was selling some radishes that were a little soft. The radish greens were kind of goopy and he, he cut them off and gave me a break on the radishes. The radishes were good, they were tasty, but they weren't really fresh. Like I said, you could tell from the tops were sort of wilted and starting to rot. I did this, I very carefully cut them up, made my two and a half percent brine, put my little weight on top, and they molded. Um, there was all kinds of nasty stuff on the on the surface of the water and the, the radishes themselves were just mushy after a couple of days and I thought, oh, these are those radishes that I bought at the market that weren't fresh. When you make pickles, find the freshest uh, cucumbers that you can. If you know, if, you, if they, the leaves spit like flexible, if they give, if you push on them with your finger and they feel soft, leave them. Go to the next stand and look for, look for better pickles, look for better um, pickling cukes because the crisper they are when you put them in the brine, the crisper they are when they're gonna come out of that brine. So use you know, the freshest vegetables that you can find to, to make your ferments. Um, that's all I can think of for right now, guys. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope I answered a lot of questions. I hope maybe you came up with some new questions that you can leave in the comments section below. I'm real good about you know, keeping up with the, with the, with the d discussion on, the, on these videos. So please feel free to comment. Please, please subscribe to the channel. If you like this video, check out the other fermenting videos I've got on the channel. I'm shooting for 5,000 subscribers. I'm, I'm hoping to get there by the end of the year and i um, getting pretty close. So thanks to everybody that subscribed. Love you guys. And I'll see you next time with uh, fermented apples for the apple season. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.